Welcome to the discussion on aerobic and anaerobic cellular respiration. But before I begin uh, my lecture, I want to first define two terms. That's aerobic and anaerobic. So aerobic basically means the presence of oxygen. So when I talk about aerobic cellular respiration, there's going to be oxygen involved. Anaerobic is the opposite. Instead of with oxygen, it's going to mean the absence of oxygen. So we're going to do cellular respiration, but there will be no molecules of oxygen involved. So with that said, I'm going to start going over cellular respiration. And so keep in mind what I mentioned in the next slide, this will be either with or without oxygen, so aerobic or anaerobic. So in both cases, we're going to go to the next slide. So I guess what I'm trying to say is regardless of the presence or absence of oxygen, whether we're doing aerobic or anaerobic cellular respiration, everything on this slide holds true. So in general, cellular respiration is going to begin when glucose enters the glycosidic pathway, so glycolysis. And it's going to exit and it's going to form two molecules of pyruvate right here. But in the process it's going to use some ATP, it's going to give up some ATP, so it's going to generate ultimately two molecules of ATP. We're also going to reduce NAD+, because NAD+, is going to grab electrons, and it's going to generate these two molecules of NADH. These two molecules of NADH are then going to fuel, or feed I should say, into the electron transport chain as shown in this arrow here. Go back to that pyruvate. That pyruvate itself enters the intermediate step. It's converted to acetyl-CoA in the process. It's giving off a byproduct, a waste product, two molecules of carbon dioxide. These are uh, diffused across the cell membrane of the cells, and that's the last you see of them. That acetyl-CoA enters what we call the Krebs cycle and it gives off four more, for every two acetyl-CoA's, it gives off four molecules of carbon dioxide. So at this point, at the end of the Krebs cycle, we say that glucose has been completely oxidized because it's lost all the electrons that it's going to lose. Now, the Krebs cycle has generated two more molecules of ATP, but it's generated tons of reduced NAD+, so reduced in the form of NADH, and it's reduced another similar molecule, FAD2, FADH2. Now the whole purpose of this was, um, again, to extract energy, so the NADH and the FADH2s are still packed with energy. We're going to extract those energies carefully so that we don't get an explosion in the cells during this electron transport chain. This electron transport chain is going to transport the electrons from one molecule to another and then eventually it's going to pump out, it's going to uh, also pump out hydrogen protons across the membrane. Now what this gradient does, we're going to form a hydrogen proton gradient on one side of the membrane. Now this gradient is going to force those molecules to want to come back in, so it's going to, they want to move against their gradient. And so if you remember there's going to be an enzyme called the ATP synthase. So these molecules, these hydrogen protons, are going to pump across the ATP synthase during chemiosmosis, and this is when all the energy is, re is released in the form of 32 to 34, that should say 34 here, not 24, so into 34 molecules of ATP. At that point, um, the cellular respiration is done, but it's going to be in this electron transport chain where the difference lies, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic cellular respiration. So let's go to the next slide and we're going to um, um, look at electron transport chain in a little bit more detail. Okay, so this slide shows a membrane, and in particular, it's the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So this is a eukaryotic cell. If this was a prokaryotic cell, such as an archaea or a bacteria, oops, didn't mean to do that. Let's put on my drawing pen. This membrane would actually be the cell membrane. 
And so in the process, we start out here's NADH. The, what this slide doesn't show is the FADH2. That also, FADH2. That also somehow feeds in here and makes FAD and donates its electrons. Now, this slide is actually a slide of cellular uh, of aerobic cellular respiration. And why do I know that? Hang on, uh, let me check something. Okay, so I had to get offline for a minute because I had to erase something. So how do I know that this is, let me get my drawing tool back, I'm sorry. How do I know that this is um, cellular, a cell, I'm sorry, aerobic cellular respiration? I know that because there's an oxygen molecule present. So the final electron, we start out with the electrons of NADH and also FADH2, uh, which was erased here. They transferred their electrons all the way here, and then the electrons travel from one molecule to another, which was a series of oxidation reduction um, uh, reactions. Finally, the, the last molecule to be reduced, that means to gain the electrons, is that of oxygen. So again, this can only occur aerobically. What this slide is showing you is that oxygen, as it gains the electrons, it's going to interact with these hydrogen protons and covalently bind to them and form water. What it's not showing you, though, is that there's actually two intermediate steps needed before the uh, oxygen is completely converted to water molecules. So for that, I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to have this oxygen molecule, and he's going to react with hydrogen protons. But instead of going directly to water, what he's doing is making this molecule. Remember, mo water only has one oxygen. This is two oxygens. So it, instead of water, it's hydrogen peroxide. Now, in low concentrations, the cells can survive. But when this hydrogen peroxide is continuously made, as the concentration increases, it becomes very toxic to the cells. And so, be so the cells don't die. Aerobic organisms, that is, organisms that can grow in the presence of oxygen, need to convert this hydrogen peroxide. So to do that, they have a, a special enzyme. This enzyme is catalase. So as soon as hydrogen peroxide is made, that catalase reacts with, uh, with oxygen again, or I'm sorry, reacts with the hydrogen peroxide, and it removes some of the oxygens to make water and gives off O2. So only the organisms that grow, can grow in the presence of, of oxygen, only the aerobic organisms have the enzyme catalase. All the anaerobic organisms, those that, that cannot grow in the presence of oxygen, they lack this catalase enzyme. They do not make it. So what happens is that if they grow in the presence of oxygen, they build up this hydrogen peroxide, and the cells eventually die, and you will not see them. So the question is, how do anaerobic organisms undergo cellular respiration? So basically, I have that in the slide, and this is our final slide for the lecture. It starts out with a question. Is oxygen the only substrate used as an electron acceptor in energy metabolism? And obviously, if I'm asking this, this question, the answer is no. So in the absence of O2, of oxygen, microbes can undergo anaerobic cellular respiration. And by doing that, they're going to substitute the electron, I'm sorry, the oxygen, um, molecules with some other substrates, such as nitrates and sulfates. So if we go back to the electron transport chain, where the final electron acceptor is oxygen, we simply substitute them with nitrates and sulfates. These organisms have the ability to use these um, electro, electron negative dense molecules to acquire those electrons. So they're going to make a different byproduct. They're not going to make water and oxygen they're going to make uh, nitrites and sulfite molecules and get that off as waste. So basically what they all have in common, whether, the, whether they undergo anaerobic or aerobic cellular respiration, they all undergo glycolysis, the intermediate step, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain with chemiosmosis. 
The only difference between the two is the final electron acceptor. So that wraps up the lecture on anaerobic and aerobic cellular respiration.